Hello. Um, ah. In the weeks around midsummer in the Orkney Islands at the north of Scotland, the sky never gets completely dark, it just dims. And um, the hours between sunset and, and sunrise uh, in Orkney is known locally as the summer dim. And there's another word for it, which like a lot of local words comes from Norse, which is the grimlins, which comes from the Norse word grimula, which means to twinkle or to glimmer. Uh, I took this photo on my phone uh, because I was lucky enough to be out driving the islands uh, in these hours for two summers because of an unusual job that I had. Um, I came from Orkney, I, I was born there and grew up there on a sheep farm, uh, although my parents are from England, which is why I don't have a strong Orcadian accent. Um, I left home and for more than a decade lived south, as we call anywhere that's not Orkney, inclu including here in, in London. Um, but my kind of once promising future had taken the well-worn and rather lonely tra trajectory of um, problem drinking, of, of alcoholism. Um, to the, and after kind of repeated attempts to control or stop my drinking, I actually ended up admitting myself to a, a rehab treatment program. Um, and when I ended this after, after three months, I'd quit my job to go into treatment, and then not only was I quite shaky and newly sober, I was unemployed. So I went um, back home to Orkney for what were quite practical reasons, because um, I didn't have a job or, or much money. Um, now, the first year of my sobriety was uh, tough. Uh, I was wanting to drink a lot and I was frustrated for, for those reasons and also at finding myself what I saw as, as washed up back in Orkney. Um, but a real turning point came for me at about exactly a year sober when I kind of on a whim uh, uh, applied for a job and rather unexpectedly found myself becoming the RSPB's corncrake officer or corncrake wife. <laughs> Upside down. Uh, this is a corn crake, and I want to play you something. So that is the call of the corn crake, and I would never have thought uh, a few years before, kind of uh, partying and living in London, that to hear this sound would become my purpose. Um, you might agree that uh, the call is a bit onomatopoeic of the corncrake's Latin name, which is Crex Crex. Uh, it's a bird a bit similar in size and shape to a moorhen, but it lives in farmland rather than wetland. Uh, the bird was once, once found across the whole of the UK, uh, but its numbers have dramatically decli declined in the 20th century, and now it's really only found in the Western Isles and Orkney here. It's on the red list of endangered species, and there are just about a thousand birds left in this country. Uh, I love this picture. Um, the corncrakes actually migrate from Africa, but when they are here breeding in this country, they are reluctant to fly. Maybe they're just exhausted. Um, and they tend to dip down instead of flying, and it's this aspect of their behavior which is partly responsible for their decline. And the, the main reason um, for the decline in numbers is uh, agriculture, and um, in particular, larger scale and more industrialized uh, agriculture. Corncrakes tend to live in the grass fields that are cut for silage and hay, so uh, when the mowers come along, it's quite common for the birds to be killed. Um, it's tr the traditional method uh, pattern of mowing is to mow from the inside of the field out, so the birds might tend to run into the small area of uncut grass and then often be killed, particularly the chicks, on, on the final swathe. Um, part of my job, uh, which they probably gave it to me because I was a farmer's daughter, was to go and visit farmers who had a corncrake on their land and talk to them about some measures they could take to improve the chances of the birds. So mowing the fields in a slightly different pattern from the inside of the field out and leaving a bit of unmown grass. Um, and uh, the RSPB, we offered them money to, to do that. Um, now, older Orcadians tend to refer to all women, regardless of marital status, as a wife. So sometimes when I turned up at a farmhouse with my RSPB sweatshirt, I'd be greeted with the corncrake wife is here. So that's kind of how I ended up with that name. Um, 
The second and largest part of my job was to locate every calling male corncrake in Orkney. Uh, <laughs> um, firstly, I do this by appealing for public reports, so I ask people if they'd heard them to call my corncrake hotline. Um, <laughs> and um, secondly, I did this by carrying out an extensive survey of all the suitable habitat in Orkney, which was most of Orkney. Um, corncrakes are no nocturnal, so I did my surveys between midnight and 3 a.m. Um, I did it by car and I also did it by ear because the birds were ex extremely elusive. So I'd, I'd drive, wind my windows down, listen for two minutes, drive 500 meters more, listen for two minutes and continue like that on every night it wasn't raining for two months. Um, uh, and this was kind of my regular, you know, my view for that time. Uh, this is the locations of corncrakes. So my work took me out to the different Orkney Islands. I'm from the mainland, um, but I got the chance to go out to these other places. I would leave the house at about 11 o'clock p.m., which is about the same time as I used to go out to nightclubs. Uh, um, at the time when it seemed like everyone else in Orkney was going to sleep, I'd drive out past the ancient standing stones, past the modern wind turbines. Um, now... Um, most nights I didn't hear a corncrake, but what I did hear, what was gradually revealed to me, was the other sounds of the islands. So I'd be sitting there with my head out the window, with my woolly hat pushing my ears forward into corncrake listening position, um, and I'd hear particularly common birds of the curlew, the oyster catcher, lapwing, uh, the dawn chorus, which would start at around 2 a.m., and the other sounds, domestic animals, the wind turbines chopping the air, um, and the sound of the sea. Um, and I was kind of reconnecting with the landscape that I grew up into and a lot of these places had memories for me so it might be a corner where I used to wait for the school bus and pick four leaf clovers it might be the passing place where I was picked up by the police when I was arrested for drink driving uh, past the airport where on the day that I was born my dad was airlifted to hospital men uh, sectioned under the Mental Health Act um, and I was also connected to the outside world through my phone, which I carried with me. I uh, uh, navigated using Google Maps, and I was on Twitter, particularly Friday, Saturday nights. I'd be thinking about what my friends were up to in London, reading their drunk tweets before they deleted them in the morning. Um, <laughs> often feeling quite frustrated and lonely, and sometimes driving home, listening to banging dance music in a great mood. All I wanted was a bottle of wine. You know, it, it was like that. Um, I had read about noctilucent cloud, which is a rare type of cloud made of ice crystals rather than water droplets um, uh, high in the atmosphere, and it's only visible at a few hours around midnight, around midsummer, in deep twilight, when the last ray of the sun will ca catch the ice um, droplets. So I and I was kind of aware that I would have the chance to see it because I was out and about during this time, and sure enough, um, this photograph is uh, marked at 1.09 a.m. and I saw it, it's the white wispy stuff up there. It was shining and it was just magic. I got out of the car and, you know, it was a special moment. So the first summer, I found 32 calling male corncrakes um, and the second summer, just 14. Um, but as you can see, there seems to be a slight upward tra trajectory um, in the numbers in Orkney. Um, and we think that if it hadn't been for the RSPB's Corncrake Initiative, there would be, they would be extinct in Orkney. Um, it kind of became, for me, like the fate of the birds became intertwined with my own fate. Um, they were clinging to existence, and I was clinging to sobriety and, and trying to live a, a normal life. Uh, I learned everything that I could about them, reading scientific papers, following... Uh, uh, tracking their migration, studies tracking their migration, um, local folklore. People didn't used to think that they migrated. They thought that maybe they went underground or transformed into other kind of birds. Um, I, I put my phone ring tone as a corncrake call. I started typing corncrake when I was trying to type other words. I set a Google alert so that any time a corncrake was mentioned in the world's media, it would be emailed to me. Um, and kind of inadvertently, these birds had become my thing, and they became something that began to, to fill the absence that was, created, uh, that was created in my life when, when I stopped drinking. I, before I started researching about it more, I had my own conception about my drinking in that it had been almost like 
whatever breaks, breaks I did have with, with regard to my drinking had been so worn down that they were never going to be repaired and um, that the only way for me to deal with this is to, to not drink at all, not take the first drink, as, as they say in AA. Um, and I actually found, well, as I started reading, that actually a lot of medical professionals, um, psychologists, neurologists kind of agree with this. For those of us that are susceptible to addiction, and it's complicated reasons why, it could be due to genetics or childhood incidents, when you start using the addictive substance, it soon becomes the default way of coping with life, and it kind of scores the neural pathways so deeply that indeed they will never be repaired, um, which firstly means that you're going to be susceptible for the rest of your life to relapse and other kinds of addiction. And secondly, it's just really hard to get out of that groove. Uh, the Corncrakes were just, uh, just one chapter of my book, and they were just one chapter of my life, but they were a very important way in for me, for sort of beginning to learn and understand about the natural world, through getting out, through knowledgeable colleagues. There were other things I began to learn about and be interested in um, astronomy, in local myth and folklore, in snorkeling and seeing all sorts of weird and wonderful sea beasties, and particularly important for, importantly for me, sea swimming, which has come to function in a lot of the same ways as alcohol used to. Um, yeah, this is me um, at 4 a.m. one morning on the small island of Westry, uh, just after I'd finished up the Corn Creek surveys for the night. Um, there are a lot of parallels, I think, between stopping drinking and the end of a relationship or, or even grief. Um, you might not feel that you can go forward, but yet you do. Um, just driving on and I was sort of driving on almost for something to do while the way that life was going to be sort of made itself clear and as I was driving I was able to unpick some of the things that had happened to me, the, the lost jobs and broken relationships and violent episodes um, that happened in my drinking and actually to go back further into thinking about the things that had formed me so thinking about my dad's mental illness my mother's religion and indeed the very cliff-edged elemental landscape that I was born into Um, and um, as, as I was driving these roads and every time that I didn't take a drink when I felt like it I was scoring new pathways um, the life that I had in the city um, parties and nightclubs it wasn't there for me anymore but um, doing these surveys being out in the gremlins following maps in the mist and listening um, I was able to find a, a new kind of nightlife okay Thank you. <laughs>